Okay. Um, I'm Jolene. I'm a student at Berkeley City College, um, and I will just get started. <laughs> um, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania. My family lived the middle class dream. We had a house in the country, my dad worked, and my mom stayed at home with me and my sisters. But I remember slowly realizing the violence, cruelty, and pain in the world. As I saw more, I wanted to change more. I wanted to do anything possible to have a world of justice, peace, equality, and human dignity. Everyone wants these things. We all want a world without war and violence, and instead, one in which everyone has enough to eat and a safe environment to live in. I grew up with a desire to change the world for the better, and my parents supported me. When I was asked what I wanted to do when I grew up, I figured out what was, I figured, I tried to figure out, at least, I tried to figure out what was both interesting to me and what, would, what work would help the world. By high school, I had the idea in my head that whatever I was passionate about, whatever issues I wanted to change in the world, should turn into my career. This meant I'd go to college for whatever field was related to my activism. So, I was always switching between different areas, different ideas for majors and specializations, from healthcare to environmental science, to international studies, and to gender equality. For example, I thought that by focusing on healthcare, my contribution could help to reform a broken system, or at the very least, to help individuals. Or by working actively in environmentalism, I hoped my work would have the potential to lessen the current environmental destruction. I explored different majors to see where I could have the most impact in enacting the changes I wanted to see in the world. I wanted to help the most urgent causes and focus in whatever area I'd be able to see changes and improvements in. But every time I settled on a topic, I realized the change would be impossible without addressing a whole series of other problems. The problems that affi afflict our world are not solitary or isolated. Each area depends on another, and I realized advancing healthcare cannot be done without clean air, clean water, safe living conditions, and a job to support oneself. I realized that environmental issues cannot be fixed without looking at how entrenched the fossil fuel industry is in the capitalist system. Internationally, I looked at the horrendous inequality and wanted to help raise the standard of living for the most downtrodden societies. But the societies that are left suffering are often the subjects of war in which mostly are caused by Western or American forces profiting off of the conflicts and supporting one side or the other, or even both sides. If it's not outright war, we see American institutions like the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank controlling the economies of other nations and leading them into debt and permanent poverty. I had to conclude that change internationally would be practically hopeless unless policies changed here. I was stuck. I saw the issues in the world were connected, but I thought the only option I had was to focus in one field and translate my passion for changing the world into a passionate career. It seemed like the best I could do in life was to get a job in my field of interest and hope that one day I could make an impact. A career would also allow me to stay in the middle class. By turning my dreams of activism into a career, the hope would be to settle down into a stable household, to climb the career ladder, ladder and to not have to pay li live paycheck to paycheck. But the reality is that the majority of people around the world and in America will never have access to the perks the middle class has here. The majority will never be able to achieve this standard of living. However, these benefits and comforts are also a way to help keep us believing in the system. They entice us to join the system rather than to fight to change it. By following the normal course of a middle class life, we accept the foundations of how the world works and instead of transforming society completely, we work towards reforms. We end up joining the society rather than changing it. Usually, this means our activism will fall within our career and therefore be constrained by it. We are forced to focus on advancing our careers with the hope that if we get far enough and land in a position of power, then we'll be able to make a difference. And lots of people want to make a real difference in the state of the world. When I was younger, I took a, a good look at those people. I felt like I saw two things happen to them. Either they got burnt out from working so hard to make a difference without seeing any real systemic changes, or they adapted to the new standards and, idea and the ideals of their youth would slip away as they got tired of fighting the system and instead tried to work within it. 
But the capitalist society system relies on the youth and the middle class to um, believing in that we can make a difference and a change in the world from within the system. But by choosing to integrate into society and work for reforms, in the end, we simply act as a band-aid to make life more tolerable. This keeps hope the this keeps the hope alive that the system can be reformed and the option of completely transforming society goes by the wayside. If we're being honest, reforms won't cut it. Our generation is looking at a very bleak picture if we continue down the road we're on. Our future is precarious and time is limited. The majority of us are juggling jobs in school and making the ends meet with loans. Our generation owes $1.2 trillion in student debt. We've seen very little improvement since the last economic downturn, and we certainly don't have the opportunities to look forward to that our parents did. The middle class is getting pushed down as the wealth gapping widens, and with wealth getting concentrated more and more at the top, there's a lot less to go around for everyone else. On top of it all, China, climate change is taking place more rapidly than predicted. This year set records across the board for heat waves, ice melt, algae blooms, coral bleaching, and the list goes on. New research says we have two to three years before our summers no longer have Arctic ice. We're facing enormous changes in our environment, and we're already feeling the effects. We're on the verge of a mass extinction, and unless we do something drastic soon, we could be on the list of endangered species. When we step back and look at the big picture, we see that these, these issues are more than just connected. They are symptoms of a disease that the entire world is suffering from. The individual symptoms can barely even be temporarily patched up. Unless we treat the disease itself, our suffering will only get worse. I, like most people, was looking at how to deal with the symptoms without having diagnosed the disease by switching from issue to issue, from healthcare to environmental issues to international development, I was attempting to patch up the worst of the wounds I saw. But the disease isn't hard to diagnose. We live in a system that has nothing to do with humanity's needs. Instead, food, water, housing, education, these are all not seen as basic human rights, but rather a way for private interests to make a profit. Meeting human needs is not the priority within our government and economic system. We live in a world with enough resources and technology to make our lives better, and yet overall, they're getting worse. Our goal has to go further than finding the most pressing pain or the most widespread ailment to simply patch up. If we truly want to address the issues in the world, which we have to, our goal must be to go to, to the root of the disease and cure it, even though there's no career that goes with it. It's clear to the vast majority of people that the 1%, the elite, aren't working for the benefit of humanity. For most people, the world today is barely even livable. Under growing debts with less time and resources, more pollution and looming unemployment, the stress alone could kill you. Under this system, it's necessary to fight long and hard for basic human rights. As long as this tiny minority of people is left with such vast power, the rest of us are fighting for crumbs. The fight for individual reforms is based on the false assumption that we have time. But if we want to have an inhabitable world in the coming decades, we have to change the entire system now. The majority of the world is against today's ruling elites and is desperate for a different world. By placing our confidence with the vast majority of humanity, we have the potential and strength to completely reform our transform our world into one that functions <laughs> for the benefit of humanity. Freudian slip? <laughs> okay. Um, we have the opportunity to no longer merely struggle for survivor, survival in a begging game from the elites. We, are already, we already have the re resources to feed, clothe, and house everyone. We have the technology to start converting everything to renewable energy sources. In a truly democratic society, everyone would have the chance to participate in working for what's best for the people, rather than um, making profits for a few. This transformation isn't so far away. There are and always have been resistance to the capitalist system all around the world. 
Today, we live in a particularly volatile time with immense opportunities to completely transform society. Although the majority of people are on the same side for the, in the fight for the future, the transformation won't come naturally. We have to have organization and an understanding of what is truly at stake. Today, at such a pinnacle time in history, individually, we're left with two choices. Our first is to integrate into the system, to accept how the world functions overall, and to try to fix what we can. This choice is a fight to reform a system that is fundamentally based on exploitation and profit, rather than human needs. It's based on the false assumption that we have enough time to patch up each individual issue and make gradual reforms under the current ruling class. The second choice is to reject the capitalist system altogether and fight for a revolution. At the foundation of this choice is the reality that we are running out of time and individual fixes won't address the overall issues we are facing. This system is long past its expiration date and it's time we face the challenge of overthrowing it. We can choose to place our confidence with the vast majority of the world and fight to make our own future. As a young person today who cares about the world we live in and the future that is better than today's, there's really only one choice. Um, I'm a healthcare worker and I'm going to talk about what it could mean to have a revolutionary perspective as a worker. Uh, we just heard a middle class per background perspective. So where does the working, where does it leave the working class? What choices do we have? We have to work to make money because it enables us to live in this society of capitalism. We can't even imagine the trials and tribulations of the middle class life. All we know is and have known is having to work to exist. What a way to live. We used to dream of becoming astronauts, doctors, scientists, and everything else that children are curious about. But these dreams are long gone because our reality is different. These are not presented as tangible opportunities. We have been brought up differently. We've been set up to follow rules, to pay attention, and not to ask too many questions. Our study is not in books, not about chemical reactions or explosions in the sky, but about reactions and explosions on the streets, around the hood, on the blacktop, and eventually at work. Not all working class people come from this type of background, but my point is that we don't have the same resources and opportunities that others with money do. All we know is the hustle and not just the song. We dream of not having to live this way for the rest of our lives. We would like to escape this reality of the working class life. For many, the idea of getting out of the situation is a dream. We hope that we won't have to work as hard as our parents. We hope to create a different story for ourselves. We're tired of the day-to-day -day grind and want to escape. We attempt to escape in different forms from, pay, from paying for private schools for our children, to get a good education because our public school system is going down the drain, to buying the latest, most expensive kicks, to fit in when we can hardly afford to pay our next water bill. For me, my mother, she built a wall. Sounds familiar? <laughs> Little Mama Trump. She built a wall around our backyard because she didn't want people in her business and she didn't want my brother and me to, to she wanted me and my brother to be safe from our neighbors or from bad influences. She couldn't afford a home with a white picket fence in a nice and safe neighborhood, so she had to settle with creating her own safety mechanisms. So I grew up thinking, like the many that get pushed by their parents, to do good in school. This led me to getting into debt to afford college, trying to get a skilled trade, and thinking that this would be my ticket to higher pay and a better life. Others don't get pushed to choose school, they just try to hustle their, their way through with whatever kind of job they can land. If and when we finally find a job, we could decide to, be the, to work for the rest of our lives or until our bodies give out on us. But it's not like we have much of a choice. So some of us will even find two or three jobs either because we needed to pay for bills, rent, or just plainly survive. 
This system pushes us to have to work and give up our time with our families and all of the other things that we would prefer to do. So we give in and think that becoming the best worker and getting recognized above others is what will help us earn more money. The goal is always to climb up the ladder of success. Some hope, want, and choose to become managers or small business people in the hopes of being on top. As if this social ladder takes you away from the existing problems. Um, all it really means is being able to feed the boss directly. Um, anyway, sure, it might mean you have more money to spend, but the only way you have it is because you're above others. And is this really a goal, to gain at the expense of others? This just means accepting the boss's rules and turning our backs on the working class while ignoring the problems that this system creates, like having to move far away to afford a house or rent, having to go to under-resourced schools, leaving our children at home to be, to be alone because we can't afford childcare, not to mention the police violence or the wars and the destruction of the environment and countless more. So whichever way we try to escape, many of, us, many of us still face the pressures of having to work more than 40 hours, whether from our bosses or from the fact the cost of living is so high, especially in the Bay Area. We get tooled around getting paid little money for making society operate. We end up having to follow someone else's rule, make someone else's life comfortable at the expense of our own comfort. This is the cycle of the working class, the class that has us feeling a weight on our shoulders just trying to stay afloat, a feeling of me against the world. All of these attempts are just us existing in this system. Do we want to continue living this way, feeling like we have no other option? With the mentality of being just a worker, which is what society makes us out to be, as if being a worker makes you less than being fully human. When we, the workers, are the ones putting in our hours, our skills, our labor, our life to make things function. If it wasn't for us, the things that people take for granted would not get done. From having clean running water to electricity to driving and transporting people and goods, paving roads, taking everyone's trash out, to working the fields, bringing food to our table, keeping our society free of diseases, etc. Without us, nothing moves. We all know the bosses wouldn't be able to do this work that we do. Yeah, we are workers, and there's nothing wrong with that. You name it. There are workers behind every product, behind every service, and behind everything we place material value in. We should be proud of this. Society runs because of us. So we need to start to ask ourselves, who really has the power? What would it mean to organize and mobilize this power? Many of us find our own ways of daily resistance from taking a little longer to do something at work because you know the pile of work is only gonna get bigger anyway, so what's the point of rushing? To clocking in from break, but still taking a two to five minute walk to the bathroom before we get back to work. These small forms of resistance show that we aren't willing to accept these rules that we're put on or put under. Just imagine if we put these forms of resistance together and came up with a collective action that would really begin to turn things around for our work in our lives. It's not enough just to have small collective actions though. It's a start. If we have an understanding that as workers, we're all getting screwed under this system, but we also have understanding that we hold the power to change things, then why wouldn't we go beyond our workplace and uniting for common interests towards uniting all workers from the underemployed to volunteers, to house moms, to caretakers, etc all workers, and I mean internationally too. If and when we do this, we could decide how healthcare should be run, how children are cared for, how schools will operate, etc. By understanding our role in society and starting to take control of our lives, we can start freeing ourselves from the pressures we feel every day. We are not here to live to work, but we should be working to live, to be alive and to be proud of the work that we do. This is not an easy task and it seems difficult because we may feel we're letting our families down. It seems difficult because we haven't seen examples in our lifetime of real organized resistance against capitalism. 
Plus the pressures of surviving are real and so is the fear of the backlashes we might get if we, get, we stick our necks out. But choosing to be a revolutionary worker means living on our own terms. It means understanding our place in society. It means taking a stand against this, against this individualistic system. The possibility of transforming society is ours. Now we just need to organize ourselves and learn from the lessons from times when workers joined together for collective fights that were led by revolutionary thinking workers. <laughs> These moments in history when workers struggle together show that we can gain class consciousness. We need to look to ourselves as the leaders of these common interests of change. We don't need others to come in and try to save us. The questions are what to decide to do. Through our actions, we can be the ones to show and teach others that it's possible. The future is up to us workers, and the real hope should be towards each other for the future of humanity. This is the hope that we should have, not the hope of escaping the working class, but of transforming our work, our society. And like Lenin once said, a working class hero is something to be. Okay, so, oh, it's a little feedback. From what we just heard, and really from the speakers um, throughout the whole weekend, is really that we're not alone in our complete dissatisfaction with the capitalist system. Many people are going through a similar process of questioning this world, their future, and what, 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 what role they want to play in changing it. But even once we identify the problem as capitalism, nothing is automatic. Even when we have a name for the kind of society we need, socialism, a society that is run collectively by the mass of people to meet the needs of humanity, not for profits, even when we understand this, still nothing is automatic. Politics is not simply a state of mind or a set of beliefs. What we do with these matters, what we do with these ideas is really what matters most, our political activity. Um, this is what Marx meant in part when he said that the point is not merely to interpret the world, but the point is to change it. The difficult task is not simply the recognition of the problem or the general solution. The hard part is now. The hard part is actually winning. Um, the hard part is making a revolution. If it were easy, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. If it were easy, it would have been done already. But we have very good reasons to be hopeful. And I don't mean some mystical hope based on some fleeting feeling, but a real hope based on real events in the world, based on a real potential for change. In spite of the incredible abundance that the capitalist system has created, we see a system wreaking havoc on the vast majority of humanity. We see a system that threatens our own species and most living things on this planet, a system of permanent warfare, of exploitation, of poverty, of inequality, and endless violence and brutality. We see a system that continuously divides the world into two camps, that of a teeny tiny elite who owns the resources of this world and the camp of the working class and the vast majority of humanity who makes the society run. But these conditions, of course, have not gone, gone unnoticed. In many countries, even including the United States, we have seen some recent movements to resist some of capitalism's attacks, some larger and some smaller. In the United States, we've seen workers in Wisconsin stand up against the tax on public sector workers. We've seen the Occupy protests. And more recent, um, we've seen protests against the racist police killings from Ferguson to Charlotte. Internationally, of course, there was the Arab Spring. We've seen movements in South Africa, massive strike waves throughout China, huge strike in India, movements throughout Europe. We've seen electoral movements supporting left-leaning politicians, some who've made the word socialism a little bit more popular, like Sanders. But at the same time, we've also seen openings on the far right openly fascist parties in some cases, as well as right-wing nationalist parties that have gained ground. And of course, in this country, we've seen Trump, who initially was dismissed as a buffoon, um, but has steadily increased his popularity and could actually become president. And what we see really is a volatile world filled with plenty of people looking uh, for answers to these problems. And things can change and move quickly. And of course, social movements will again start up suddenly. 
but ultimately which direction these go in, how far they go, whether they lead to revolutionary change or whether they're cut short or even pave the way for extreme right-wing reaction, all of this will be determined by what individuals decide to do and what perspectives they are guided by. It is in social movements where large numbers of people get activated, get pulled into struggle, where they begin to challenge their ideas, learn how society truly operates, and begin to experience the potential for ordinary people to transform society. But it is also in social movements where people decide between various strategies, between perspectives of how to push the struggle forward, and importantly, between the perspective of reform versus revolution. And we can be confident that the ruling class will continue to meet these social movements with whatever it can to stop them. Anything from brutal force to making promises of every single sort. The capitalists will promise anything to save their system. And if they remain in power, when the time comes, of course, they will take away every single gain these movements may have won. But it is in these movements that a revolutionary organization is most necessary and can be decisive. So movements don't simply repeat many of the mistakes of the past. Even the deepest social movement will not create a new society without consciously fighting for revolution. During these movements, it will take a revolutionary organization to put forth the perspective that people cannot leave the levers of power, the levers of society, in the hands of the banks and corporations or their politicians, even under new faces with new false promises. The movements must instead base their strength on their own potential, the potential of the working class that makes society run. In every social movement, its outcome depends upon the balance of forces, on which class has the power. And for a movement to carry over into revolution, the working class must take power. It must replace the tyranny of an elite with the power of the majority of society. And it is the job, it is the responsibility of a revolutionary organization to argue for such a perspective. A strategy for revolution, one that does not accept the permanent rule of the capitalist class, one that tries to deepen the movement, one that relies on the organizational strength of the working class, one that insists that it is the working class that takes hold of social power and democratically decides how to run society in its own interests. A revolution will take conscious revolutionaries to provide that perspective and to argue for it, to organize for it. But in order to achieve that, a revolutionary organization must be built now, today, before a social movement occurs, if it is to have any chance at playing a significant role. Influence is not something that could just come out of nowhere. It takes experience, it takes trust, it takes accurate assessment, proof by example, and much, much more. But most importantly, it takes actual revolutionaries, those from the working class who must become the fighters and the leaders of their class, and also those from the middle class, those who've decided to use their privilege not in the service of the capitalists, but who would decide to use their privileges in the service of the working class. And so what does that mean for us today? The working class may have changed over the years, but in, in still in every major city around the world, it is still the working class that is responsible for the vital functioning of society. And it still has the ultimate power to transform society, to create a new society. But today, and for decades, in this country and around the world, the working class has suffered serious setbacks, and more importantly, the working class has lost its connection in many places to revolutionary ideas and traditions. Even though revolutionary ideas were born in the working class, there's been a separation over the years. And today we face the enormous challenge of reconnecting revolutionary ideas and traditions back to the working class. To bring these ideas back in and organize another generation of revolutionary fighters within the working class. Revolutionaries, therefore, must build organizations today within the working class. It is through these struggles that working people begin to develop a class consciousness, to feel their strength, to understand their common struggles, to develop a confidence and a pride in their, in their class, and begin to consider solutions to the problems of capitalism, and can move in the direction of a workers' revolution. It is a mistake to think that we can wait around for the next upsurge in the working class before we try to organize within it. By then it will likely be too late. We must organize within the working class today. So what do we do? What do we see as revolutionary activity today? Most importantly, I repeat, we must build an organization of revolutionaries that is built throughout the working class. And to do this work, revolutionaries must learn to become organizers, not just excellent students of history.
It means to transmit the heritage of the working class, the pride of the working class, the struggles of the working class, the confidence of the working class to workers themselves. It means to build an organization from and within the working class. And to do this, we in Speak Out Now, a revolutionary workers group, focus some of our work at building networks of revolutionary workers and working class militants who see the possibilities in large workplaces wherever we are. Um, one tool we use is what we call a workplace newsletter. We have some examples of it in the back. These consist of a two-sided leaflet with a political editorial on the front, and on the back side are articles um, uh, written by or with workers themselves about those workplaces. This is one tool we use to group workers around us, around the newsletter, to begin to form a network of workers who we think we can link together. Yes, workers need to be able to organize where they are, but also today very few struggles can be successful if they don't link together workers from other workplaces, from all over society, to fight alongside one another. To do this, an organization of working class militants is necessary. For us, this does not mean simply to build unions. That's not enough. You know, whether workers are in a union or not in a union, in a lot of ways the problems are the same. Workers must organize and fight to gain democratic control of all their struggles, whether they have a union or not. And we have, have to build revolutionary organizations and not limit our struggle simply to the workplace. And we think it's absolutely necessary to participate in social movements. Recently for us, these have been movements around budget cuts to education, around Occupy, around the environment, and most recently protests against the police killings and more. It's important to participate, to be with people, to be in the streets, to not simply stand by as onlookers, but that too, unfortunately, is not enough. Whenever these movements begin outside of the working class, it's important to try to connect these struggles to the working class in every single way we can. Because so long as these movements re remain outside of and disconnected from the working class itself, the fate of these movements will be decided in advance. It is our view that the kind of organization that needs to be built will be forged out of the struggles to come with different groups coming together based upon their similar organizational goals and methods, but most importantly, who agree um, and recognize the revolutionary role of the working class. And also for us, a revolutionary organization must be an international one. The problems of capitalism are across the globe, impacting people everywhere. The only solution to capitalism is an international one. That's why we try to stay informed of struggles and events all over the world. That's why we have uh, actively try to build links with revolutionaries in other countries. It's why we had guests over the weekend from France and Germany. It's why we think it's necessary to understand the workers' struggle in Egypt and Tunisia, as we heard about yesterday. And, and for us, this is a work, too, that, that can't wait for some time in the future, but must also be a priority today. And so, in conclusion, today we can say many people are connecting the dots of the problems in our society. And perhaps many are coming to see the failure of capitalism, to see the dead-end path that it is on. But for some, it may be easier to imagine the end of our species than it is to imagine the end of capitalism, let alone a socialist society brought into uh, being. But there's only one group in society that does the work of providing a revolutionary perspective. There's only one group of, in society of, that has the goal of organizing with revolution in mind of working towards that goal, and that is revolutionaries. No one else is going to do this work for us. Revolutionaries don't happen without organizations doing this work, and even though it may be hard to imagine this change happening today, for me, what's even harder to imagine is continuing on the current path and doing nothing to stop it. We have a world to win, we have a world to create, we have the vast majority of people on our side, and what a time to be alive. The future of humanity is likely going to be determined within the course of our lifetimes. We aren't going to get multiple chances at this. A future is going to come about, but what that future is can be up to us. And so we encourage you to join us really in what is surely going to be the task of our lifetimes. Thank you.